Coming up next, On The Spot. We catch up with everyone's favorite globetrotting kleptomaniac in Uncharted 3, duck under high-res boxes in Metal Gear Solid HD collection, and blast waves of low-res bad guys in Serious Sam The Random Encounter. There's also chases in Need for Speed The Run, a starting block for Battlefield 3, and a look at the Ember Isle update for Rift. We're live and on the spot. Welcome to another episode of On The Spot, uh, GameSpot viewers. It is Thursday, November 3rd. I'm your uh, third in command host, Kevin Van Ord. Um, both Sean McInnes and Chris Waters are out today, so that leaves me sitting in this fine, fine red chair. Sitting next to me is the fine Tom McShay. Thank you. Absolutely. And uh, we've got a big show actually ahead for you tonight. We've got uh, tonight, yeah, it is night in some places. <laughs> Um, we've got uh, Metal Gear Solid HD, um, we've got Need for Speed, The Run to show today, and we've got an extra special trivia prize, so if you're into StarCraft II, you might want to, uh, you might want to stay tuned so you can see that, win that, if you can answer the extra special trivia question. I was up all night coming up with this question, so don't let me down. Um, but Tom, you're here to show also something extra special, and what is that? It's the Uncharted game. Really? The third such game in the series. Uncharted the third, is that the name of it? The third Uncharted, yes. Right, right. good. Uh, Drake's Deception. So I'm gonna just fire up a part um, in like the middle of the game to show you it's Yeah, show off. us now, can you uh, give us, a, tell us exactly what's going on or what we should know before Drake going Drake is this. in a bit of trouble. Shocker. He's got people who want him dead and he does not want to die. So I'm gonna show you how he avoids death. That's, uh, that's an exceptional setup. Let's take, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's take a look and see what's going on. Yeah. Um, so one of the biggest differences between this, the, the change between three and two, is that they made like, they made punching a priority. So this is a scene where you get to punch a lot of people. Um, he, he starts out by being punched, obviously. So this is this is just it. Like there are a few scenes in this game where you just get to punch people in the face or in the nose, and you can uh, slam them into. This guy's being a jerk. You can slam them there, and then oh, what am I gonna do? Now, if, you've, if you're out there in the audience and you have questions for Mr. Tom O'Shea about Uncharted 3, um, shout them out, put them in the comments, put them in the chat, and uh, we will get to them as best we can. So, um... Now, now, now Tom O'Shea, um, that's some nice, uh, that's some nice bullet time right there. Seriously, so you have to see what's going on. I'm hitting someone in the head with a bottle. Now, how much, in, in terms of the, the melee, how much more melee is there in Uncharted 3 than there was in Uncharted 2? There's, there's a lot because they, like, apparently this was, like, their dream for Uncharted in the, from the beginning, and they just couldn't implement it until the third. It's just to have punching scenes. So they kind of liberally used them throughout the game because they really just wanted to punch people. So you're saying Naughty Dog's dream is always put... To, to make a lot of punching in Uncharted, but they were just never able to realize that this is, until now. This is a true thing that, that, that one of the developers <laughs> said that they just couldn't realize until now. Um, which is kind of a funny, funny thing ultimately, but it's, it is fun to punch people. It's, it's kind of like a Batman style where like, you know, it's kind of a QTE, but it doesn't really feel like it. So you're just you're given the prompts to counter right. and whatnot. So what's the, uh, what's the setting here? Where, what, what kind of place are we? Nick is fulfilling his dream Shit, of being on a boat. There are a lot of dreams being talked about. I know. Wishes, dreams. He always wanted to be on a boat, and now he's on a boat punching men. So this is basically all he ever wanted. He really likes to punch tall men, and then that avoid a, That's a big dude. I know. I, I mean, mean Nathan them. Drake's kind of a kind of a tall tall guy, right? But this that's every one of these fights always ends up being a really tall dude. He's like he's like seven feet tall. Nah, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Stay down. I wish I could just pick up a bottle nice. with him, but you can't, you can't actually do that. So now I'm going to figure out where, what to do on this boat. So a uh, question from the audience. Um, somebody wants to know, do game saves from previous games carry over in Uncharted 3? You talking about Uncharted 2? Uh, yeah, from Uncharted 2. I you, think read my mind, Tom McShay. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of vaguely remember an unlockable. But I'm not 100% sure if I make that up or not. I might be thinking of Dead Rising. Right, but this isn't this isn't Mass Effect, where decisions that you have made in the in the previous <laughs> game. It's such a decision uh, series, you know. Um, I'm I'm not positive. There, you might get a skin or something in multiplayer, but there's not going to be like anything significant. I didn't know I was going to get questions I wasn't prepared for. I wasn't prepared for that. 
Really? So usually, <laughs> usually you expect the questions that come your way to be ones that you can know in advance. Yeah, you're supposed to like tell me beforehand, and then I do a little research. Well, I ask our readers if if you know Tom O'Shea is going to be on the show, and you have any potential questions, send them his way. Anything at all, really, about any game. You know, Tom O'Shea, what is the circumference of the Earth? Send them in. Yeah, if you give me five minutes in a Google computer, I will tell you any question. In a Google you have. computer. Anything you need to know. So this I, is where Nathan swings. I heard you say the other day that you were going to bing something. <laughs> I did not say that. Oh, OK. I hope he swings. He was swinging for a second there. What are you doing, Tom? <laughs> you played this game, right? There oh, we no. go. Oh, no. I, Good job. I wanted to show you what happened if uh, I just screwed up. Isn't that the way it always is? Everything's fine until we show it on the show. And, and then it's like, oh, I yeah. don't remember how to play this. <laughs> this is why it took me 30 hours to beat this 10-hour game. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's a joke, everybody. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And I almost selected crushing difficulty before we started, which would have removed all the prompts during the punching. Yeah, but that would Kevin affect... Kevin talked me out of it. That wouldn't that wouldn't have affected the platforming, right? You're just bad at this. Well, I it's not so much bad as that I'm not good. Oh, okay. Well, th well th there is a difference, clearly. A very big difference. You no. Know, there's there's a whole there's a whole okay. um, mediocre kind of in between. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> yeah, I totally just like glitched through that. And then we jump, and that's uh, nice. I know. And in we go. I right, know we're talking. Is there going to be any shooting, Tom McShay? I'm well, kind of he tired picked of the up, punching. He picked up really? Yeah, I'm tired of the punching. I'm tired Did of the Did you see Let's... my my video that I made called Groin Punching a Tribute? Yeah, but you didn't punch any groins. Though, I know so. I didn't punch any groins. The best part of the punching is actually the parts where you're not necessarily supposed to punch, and you just can. Uh, this, this. Oh, I thought you were going to say the best part is when you punch a dude in the groin. Oh well, yeah. That, too. I had that written like two or three times in my review, and you guys made me edit it out and just, just one. Well, it's because you didn't use the word groin. You were being no. a lot more specific. No, I used <laughs> So this is where he sees that he's on a boat. And he's like, whoa, my dream is fulfilled. I'm on a boat. He didn't know before that he was on a boat? He, he just woke up there one day? Well, yeah, that's actually what happened. <laughs> OK. Yeah, he was, he was abducted. He didn't know. So I guess there's going to be a little more platforming. I don't know if we're going to get to the shooting part. And it's probably for the best if we don't, because this is the hardest oh, shooting Tom. in the game. I, I didn't know what to do there. I haven't played this before. All right, let's, let's do this again. One more time. What's feeling? <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody else out there has any questions for Tom O'Shea about, for example, has he ever played a platformer before, um, feel free to, to put them in the comments. Um, put them in the chat, and we'll, we'll get to them as best we can. There we Oh, oh yeah, that wasn't my fault, though. Really? I just jumped right over the bar. This is, it's a very structured, scripted thing, and if you didn't, he didn't grab on what he was Do it now. To. See, okay, that's all over. you needed. Well, I wanted to you just need a little prompting. So he so you, should, he you, you expect this. prompts and everything. It's a button prompt. In this case, it's a Kevin voice prompt. It's a Kevin voice prompt. Yeah. It's really good. More games need to have that. <sighs> Fewer button prompts, more Kevin voice prompts. I'm really ashamed of you. I don't really know what happened there. I couldn't see. What happened? You, you, you but why didn't jump? I make that jump? But it is good to note, at least, that for the major jumps, you, you just reset right beforehand. Yeah. There oh, you that's go. That's what it was. I, I, in my defense, I can't always see what's going on because the screen's not good. It, to it is true that uh, that it's TV is It's one of the reasons I chose a non-shooting part because it's really hard to shoot on this TV. But. OK, so now I'm in the water, and I'm swinging. Swimming. I don't know. You're swinging and swimming. <laughs> yeah. So this is actually now. Did you see what they showed at E3 this year? The whole the whole shootout on the on the cruise, like the cruise liner. No, um, I, I is actually this, is this before this or after that? This is right before that. It's right before that. So we are heading to. Uh, but that we're not gonna get that far. Okay. It's a little way still. But that's that was one of the most impressive parts of, parts of the game cinematically, I assume was because uh, it, it looked pretty impressive at E3, which is the, you know, you have the chandelier, you know, you know swinging back and forth above you and things like that. It was pretty There's intense. a lot of really impressive cinematic things in this game. I don't know, I don't know where am I supposed to go? I thought I just jumped right over there. Okay, there we go. OK, this is actually one of the hardest parts of the game. There's, there's no way I'm not going to die, but whatever. You guys have seen me die. So we're actually going to see some shooting now. Do you want to see shooting? Yeah, go ahead, I'll shoot. Just, I'll be a crazy man. All right. OK, what if I just do this for a second so you guys can watch what happens? Ooh, this is exciting, right? Uh, game options, no. Camera options. Sorry about this. I don't play, you know, I play inverted. I'm an inverted guy. Except when you're platforming. <laughs> so this dude, 
for instance. Oh no, he stopped walking. Now Uncharted 2 okay, had... Okay, I'm, I'm gonna punch him. Okay, punch. Uncharted 2 had some, some stealth sections. Are there are there many stealth There's no stealth in this. There's no stealth whatsoever? Um, not really. Good job. Oh, you 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 live. You're know, in the water, totally but live. you live. Oh no, then I got shot to death. Do it one more time. Okay. Uh, Raider wants to know, um, there's co-op for the story this time, right? What? That is... That I like is... the way that's worded. There's co-op, right? Because if you can't say yes, it's your fault. There's, there's actually five co-op story type things that are separate from the main campaign that are awesome because they made punching a lot more formidable than in the campaign. I'm wondering how, how would that even work? In the campaign, I, I mean, this is a, this is Drake's story. I'm not even sure I know. Well, it's how also that would... just, I mean, because most of the story you're with someone anyway, except for this part. You're basically with, you know, Sully or whatever. So I guess it could work in that regard, but it's so like scripted yeah. that it would be kind of frustrating to play it. To Camera some... angles. Yeah, just just and... everything. I don't know. Do it. There you go. Rocket launchers are a lot better than that little pea shooter you had. <laughs> yeah, if I'm gonna murder, I might as well murder in style. Or, oh, I don't want to be sniped. I want to punch a dude. Couple readers want to know, um, can you stop dying? No. What, what, what answer do you have for that, Tom McShay? Uh, I thought that's what people wanted to see. People seem to like the black and white a lot. Like, oh, but like I, in every game, I right? forgot to uh, I forgot to put in the most important part. Lol. What? Yeah. Yeah. They're lolling at you right now, Tom McShay. Eh, whatever. You are bringing, <laughs> you are bringing our, our viewers lore-worthy events. Yeah, I know. This isn't, this, oh, there's another rocket launcher around here. Hooray. There we go. All right. Shoot dudes. Why, do you, why are you so violent? There's, some, there's, there's cover. Take some cover, shoot some dudes. Why do I need to shoot dudes? Why can't I just get through the whole game without shooting dudes? How possible is that? Not possible at all. This is not Metal Gear Solid 2. I don't see anyone there. There he is. There. You're being yeah. shot. I know. The, another clue is when that little red laser yes. thing is on top of you. No, I got that. You can that. guess where the you... dude might be. I'm being I'm being a little flushed to show off some stuff, and I can't actually see the enemies. All right. Well, it's it's, it's not it's not the ideal setup. But well, yeah. The good news is that we're gonna have to wrap up this segment. Yay! So Tom McShay, now that you've shown Uncharted Three clearly at its best. Um, what what should we know about it? Is the game out? Um, what system? Answer all the questions that, that anybody would really, be asking. Dumb questions. You don't know this? Would need to know. It's on the PlayStation. All right, it's on and the it, PlayStation. And it came out Tuesday. It came out two days ago. Excellent. It's a very good game. It's awesome. And it sells at the fifty nine ninety nine price point? Yes, <laughs> it sells at the standard price point. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks for showing off some Uncharted 3. Excellent game. 9.0 according to GameSpots.com. <laughs> and uh, on that note, there's another Tom that wants to speak. That Tom would be Tom Magrino. Let's check in with the news and see what's going on out there. Welcome to your GameSpot News Update for Thursday, November 3rd. Tom Magrino here to provide you with a look at the very best of news for the week without a crazy British accent. So I can talk about either layoffs or sales figures. Sales figures, layoffs. Layoffs. Silicon Knights, better known as the maker of the critically panned Two Human and the even more critically panned X-Men Destiny, confirmed this week that it had cut staff by about 50%. Staff cuts came after an unnamed publisher opted out of an unnamed and as yet not critically panned game. Silicon Knights is still working on said game, and it also plans to start production on, quote, one of its most requested titles for the next generation. Could be another Two Human, or it could be a follow-up to Silicon Knights' crowning achievement, Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem. And now, ha ha ha, sales figures. Sony reported its three-month earnings this week, and while company-wide revenue was down, PlayStation 3 sales were actually up year over year. During the July to September quarter, Sony sold 3.7 million units worldwide. That figure was significantly higher than the 2.3 million Xbox 360 units that Microsoft sold during the same period, and the 3.35 million Wii units Nintendo sold during the six month April to September period. While Microsoft takes a dominant share of the console market in North America, the PS3 is on place to eclipse Xbox 360 sales worldwide within the next couple of quarters. Two other quick Sony notes, PlayStation Home relaunched, and the company patented a biometric controller that reads a player's state of mind, period, end sentence, moving on. In addition to bagging Trials HD maker Red Lynx this week, Ubisoft, a French company, has commissioned its Canadian stronghold Ubisoft Montreal to make a game about American terrorists. 
Why is this anything less than an affront to this brave, bold, sovereign land? Because that game is totally Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Patriots. It's in development for the Xbox 360, PS3, and PC, and is due for release sometime in 2013. Okay, that does it for today. For more on these stories and other news headlines, head on over to news.gamespot.com. Thank you very much, Tom Marino, for bringing us the latest in headlines. Now, I'm sitting here with Marco Georgievich. Hi. Marco, um, you are here to show Metal Gear Solid HD collection. Yes, I am. And uh, kind, of, kind of fill us in, first of all, on what's included in this collection. All right, so we've got the last two PS2 games, so Metal Gear Solid 2 and Metal Gear Solid 3. Not to mention, we also have the PSP game, Peace Walker. Right. All in one huge package. Right. So, and you've, you've played a little bit. Yes. Um, and we're going to be taking a look at Metal Gear Solid which? We're going to jump into Metal Gear Solid 2. Okay. Just because it is, it is the oldest game of the three games. So right. Let's, let's, you know, show off what they've managed to improve since 2001. Sure. Now, do you know if they were, um, if they were um, working from the, the version that came out on, the, on the, the, PS, the PS2, or are they working on the version that came out on Xbox? I believe they're still using the PS2 version, but they're not using the, first, uh, the initial release. They're using the subsistence and substance okay. versions. So you're getting the game a little bit older, you know, the re-release versions of the sure. games. So in order to show content, because we know Metal Gear Solid games have you know, 30 minutes worth of cutscenes and stuff, I'll just quickly skip through all of this and just get straight into the action. Sure. I want to say, not that there's anything wrong with that. Not, yeah, exactly. As a, as a big MGS fan, I want to make sure it's clear that we're not anti-storytelling in well, our MGS. Well, the thing is that there are other people on the show today, so I can't hog all, this, you know, all the, the limelight. So well, if I had my way, Metal Gear Solid would always hog the limelight. Oh, really? But that's all right. All right. Yeah. Taking a look at Snake. Yep. Now, now as we get in, um, the HD, all right, so this is an older game that's brought yes. to us in HD. How would you say that Metal Gear Solid 2 holds up in HD, you know, compared to like other HD collections that have come out, like Shadow of the Colossus and Eco and, and, and uh, God of War and those things? To be honest, I wish I kind of had an opportunity beforehand to grab, you know, the original PlayStation 2 games and to really compare the two. Because as soon as I started up with the HD versions, for me it looked as though nothing had changed. Like it was, and that's a good sense thinking that, wow, this must have been the way it looked back, you know, ten years ago. Right. Because it was just so hard to remember how those games looked. Because they were originally such fantastic titles to begin with. Right. You know, you had great visuals, you had great sound design, and everything. It was just fantastic. So I think this kind of the series lucked out, where you know, ten years later, it still looks fantastic. Yeah. Well, good-looking games are good-looking games all the you know, time. Yeah. For, for, forever. Exactly. So. Uh, somebody asking if this is a downloadable title. I think we already know the answer to that, which is no. No, exactly. Um, this is a retail release that includes three games on it. It's yeah, it's too big to be a downloadable title. Now I'm cu I'm curious from from my perspective because I did play a little of this at E3, and but I but I played um, Peace Walker, and I'm wondering if you played any Peace Walker in, from the collection yet. I'm, from the collection, yes, I have actually. If you wanted to, we could have jumped into that. Uh, this morning I was trying out the transpiring feature. Sure. So uh, you know, I took my save from my PSP version, and I put it in. I put it in, on the system, transferred the data. The only downside is that if you're transferring data from PlayStation Portable to PlayStation 3, you don't get trophies. Right. So if you're one of those people that are big on trophy collecting in any game, you're gonna miss out on that. Well, that kind of stinks. But, to, to some degree, but, but there's, Peace there, Walker there's, is a fantastic game. Sure. So, so you, you play it because out. playing it is its own reward. Yeah, exactly. But my, I, I think my question was sort of, you know. How does it, it's, it's a little bit more bite-sized, like the areas are smaller and yes. there are more loading screens and things like that in Peace Walker because of the nature of the, the PSP hardware. And I'm, I'm sort of curious about, do you think as a, as a console game that, that's, that that holds up? Do you think that it, it works on console or does it come across as something that was meant to be a little more bite-sized? I think it's still meant to be bite-sized because of the fact that they built the, that game to have uh, co-op with the PSP so you're, you, know, you, you can invite friends into certain missions. I haven't been able to try that because we are using it on a debug, so I don't even know if that feature is even available in the game. You know, so if you're someone who want, you know, enjoy that, and a lot of the missions, like a lot of the boss battles in Peace Walker, require like really were helpful if you had someone else playing with you, right? Because it made it a lot easier. Now, we've seen uh, in a couple, you know, some new features in some of the HD remakes that yes. have come aboard. We've got Halo coming up that that adds some new some new stuff that Halo One did not have. Um, so what about this collection? Are there any new gameplay features that, that come with it? Well, as I was saying, they're using the subsistence and substance uh, versions of the game. So those already did have ex additional content. Sure. So with uh, Metal Gear Solid 2, you got the VR missions, 
Like if, if you guys want, I can die, get out, and I can show off those sections as well. No, I, I actually like this. I'd rather see you not die as okay. a refreshing change for today's On The Spot episode. <laughs> yeah, but I gotta try to keep up with what uh, Tom managed to be, you know? That's, um, that's true. He is a tough following act to up follow. Following up to that was uh, quite a challenge. It's quite a challenge. But follow what you are doing. Okay, let's just go outside to avoid the radar. But there's, as far as you know, there's nothing specific to this release. It includes the enhanced editions of these games. Not that I'm aware of with the version that we got. Again, I think the only the, the standout feature is the fact that you can transfer for Peace Walker. Right. So if you are one of those people that had the PlayStation portable version of the game, you can transfer your data. That is, I would say, a cool feature because it's nice to be able to you know play the game on the PS3. You're, you know, you're jumping on the bus, you're jumping on the Bart and Mooney, whatever, the, you know, whatever you're on. You can continue playing and then again transfer. But it does use one save file for that. So, you know, when you're transferred from one to the other, it does delete the file. So, you gotta be careful not to screw up. Ooh, pardon me. And so, of course, this being Metal Gear Solid, you have lots of different options on how you want to take care of some of these guys. I've yep. seen you flat out shooting. You can do um, some CQC. Yes. Um, but you can also um, just go the non killing route. If you want to sneak around, you can sneak around. Yeah, but what fun is that, you know? You want to cause problems. Well, this, the th it's funny because some of the things that we would normally do don't necessarily show up well on a show. If you were to sneak <laughs> around, um, it may not show on, on the spot as well as if you just go around causing havoc everywhere you go. But Metal Gear Solid fans know that there's something incredibly awesome about sneaking your way around and not getting caught. And sometimes getting caught. That's true. Yeah. But obviously, if you have any questions about Metal Gear Solid HD Collection, um, send them our way in the chat or in the comments section, and Marco Djordjevic will be happy to, to answer. Um, yep. Game over. Well, for that, I do want to show off Metal Gear Solid 3, so I'm going to jump right. into another game, because there's so much in this game. You can't, just showing off one little snippet, it's not enough. Now, so we're going to see some jungle? Yes. Well, do we want to show off Metal Gear Solid 3, or do we want to show off Peace Walker? because I'd prefer to show Peace Walker, because it is a PSP version, just to show how much it's actually improved. Let's go ahead and take a look. Let's go ahead and take a look at Peace Walker. I mean, because obviously, you know, it's it's being, you know, up from a smaller screen. Yep. You know, it's, it's going to be kind of interesting to see how it looks on the big screen compared yep. to the, the smaller PSP screen. A um, couple of people wanting to know, too, is is this uh, PS3 only, or is there a PC version, a version for other, other just, platforms? Just PS3 and Xbox 360. Okay. So there's a version. But I think that on the PS3 side, there is a special edition that comes with an art book and some other trinkets. I don't know if the PS3, I mean, the 360 version has that. Okay. So... There's still something, and it's, I think it's only a $49.99 uh, package, so it's not the $39.99 that we're standard, you know, custom for re-releases, but considering there's three games. It is three games. Yeah. Um, and they are, you know, there is a little bit of an extra feature there in the transferring for the, you know, if you played Peace Walker on the PSP. Exactly. Yeah, so. Um, also, you, have you found um, any Easter eggs? Have you come across anything? A couple of people wanting to know if there were any Easter eggs that weren't in the originals or anything that you've come across that is sort of a nod. Uh, there actually is. Um, it's not so much an Easter egg. I, I guess you could consider it an Easter egg. There's a trophy you get in Metal Gear Solid 3. You know how Otacon's in Metal Gear Solid 3? Sure. If you kill him, you get a trophy for that. Really? Because you're essentially you're, you're screwing up the game. So what happens is you get a trophy, um, trophy mark on the top, and it says, well, "Game over, mission accomplished." Because you've essentially you've eliminated the reasons to have the additional games. Because without Otacon, there is no need to have Metal Gear Solid One, Two, and Four, especially. So there's little now, treats like that. Now let's say because we're waiting for the game to load. Yes, we, I we apologize for wanna, it taking forever. Absolutely, we obviously want to show more, but um, I, I'm kind of curious. Now let's say I played Metal Gear Solid Four. Yes. Um, but I'm not familiar with Three or Two, or I haven't played Twin Snakes or the original or anything like that. What would, how would you say that these games hold up, not necessarily visually, obviously, because Metal Gear Solid 4 looked amazing, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the gameplay, how does it feel? Does it still feel like a, a game that you can pick up in the modern day and, uh, and start playing and have a really good time with? Yes and no. I think the issue, uh, not so much an issue, but uh, the fact of the matter is that these are 10-year-old games, and they've kept a lot of the issues that people had from the past still intact. So if you had a problem where you didn't enjoy you know, the aiming or the movement, it's still there. Right. So one, you know, even though with man, with man eater specifically, you know, they sorry snake eater. I don't know why I said man eater. Man eater. You've been listening to a lot of Hall and Oates. <laughs> yes, actually. I have. I apologize. But in, in Metal Gear Solid Three, you do have that ability where you can, you know, still move in first person. So you have that feature. So everything is still intact in that regard. Right. But at the same time, you know, you've got some things that are not. You know, there are some minor changes. I think the one that you'll notice the most is with um, with Peace Walker. 
which we're we're definitely going to see. It's I'm, going I'm to trying happen. my best. And the thing is that we didn't. I didn't set up my profile for the game right now, so I'm actually restarting everything. So all the work that I did ahead of time, it's not there. So we've I messed you up. Yeah. But, but on the bright side, you're not you're not dying in any of the loading screens. Exactly. So uh, I'm not losing. Absolutely. Um. So uh, while we wait. Yes. Um, when when is the collection out? Comes out on Tuesday. Comes out on Tuesday. That's November eighth or the seventh, whichever day Tuesday is actually. Yes. And of course Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. Yeah. And it looks like we're finally getting we're into finally Peace getting Walker. Finally getting into it. Yes. Let's take a look. This is one of the most excellent parts of the game. Is the you know the text. Yes. But then we'll actually see something happen. Can we can we actually skip any of this? Or? I'm, I'm I'm getting we're, to it. Oh okay. Sorry. I hear I hear the rumblings in the background. Sorry. Well. I want to see interesting things here on on the spot. People aren't so interested in seeing my face or over mine and over and over again when they'd rather see things like Konami Digital Entertainment. It's a much more interesting thing. Here we find. Okay, here go. we go. I can skip the tutorial because I know this game. It was a it was a really interesting opening for that game, though, wasn't it? Yes, very, very well, atmospheric. Because when when the game launched last year, they used uh, cart, you know comic book style cutscenes, and that's sure. still intact here. So you even have the um, the you know the quick time events in the game, mm -hmm. so we have to you know quickly react to the comic strips. That's still intact. So they really did not take anything out. That's Everything great. is intact. So it is the PSP version of the game, to it in its entirety. And those look. Absolutely stupendous, yeah. even on the big screen in this case. So don't don't worry. And at least in the case of the comic cutscenes, that you're getting a, what might seem a bastardized version of, of what was on the other platform, because that, that looks really great. Yeah. Again, I am so sorry for this, people. Please don't troll me on the comments. That's all right. We have nothing better to do but sit here and you know, stare at my wrist that has no watch on it. But I'm making a point here. Yes. Okay. Know. I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. So we're getting into the prologue. It's going to be the beginning of the game. But all this really because we want to take a look. We want to yes. we want to see how Peace Walker holds up on a on a big screen on the new platform in HD. And right now this and is actually in engine. You know, there's no cutscene right and now. Here we go. This is how the game actually looks. So it's taken a while. Miller here. Do you copy? You know, and obviously it, it's it's kind of interesting to see this on the big screen too because it makes you appreciate this was on a PSP. Exactly. This is on a handheld. And you know, it, it just it goes to show you that how how impressive it was that that Metal Gear Solid in this kind of form did show up on a handheld. So right now I'm just, you know, getting re-familiarized with the controls. Sure. Um, there are, I see a question that we have, you want to ask me? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll get to that. It's, hey, 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 are you, are you distrusting me, my ability to take questions? Mark? No, I just see, I'm, I'm being distracted by someone highlighting and unhighlighting the text right. on the screen. Yeah, how do the, so a couple of people want to know, and I assume a couple because there's one question up there, so I'm going to assume that, you know, a couple of people want to know. Yes. How do the controls differ from the PSP version? I actually like it with a PSP controller. It really does feel a little bit, a little bit easier to manage. I well, it has more buttons on, exactly. the, on the 6 axis for one. Okay, blow up. There we go. Oh. I meant to do that. Bravo. I meant to do that. I, ha I have to get to the next area, so that was necessary. And this is what I was really curious about, whether, you, you know, whether on the big screen, whether the frequent loading times do seem more jarring. You almost kind of expect that kind of thing on the smaller scale. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when you're sitting in front of your TV, you, you might expect maybe a more fluid fluid experience. So I, I, that is something that I was curious about. Well, the thing is, I, the, only, on. the only issue that I really noticed is that the initial loading, because you have to go from the main screen, you know, the, the game select screen, to the uh, game screens, and that process, that sure. took a little time as we saw how we have to, you sure. know, drag on our little segment there. But once you're in the game, these little parts are, they run pretty smoothly, and there's no real long loading in between sequences. Let's take a little bit more, go into this next section, and uh, then we'll be wrapping up, I'm yes. afraid. And it, it has been fun to sort of bring, you know, loading time, time, to our to our viewers. But uh, let's let's take one more look, just because I like the I like the jungles. I yeah, think the, the, the lighting actually looks really good. There they are. CIA Although Snake does look a little bit like when you're when you're in that really close behind you, he does sort of look like he's um, tanking around rather than actually walking. He just looks like he's kind of... Yeah, that was one of the things I think some people didn't... Smoothing forward. Yeah, they didn't really like in the PSP version, but, you know, he's, he's moving cautiously doing? through the, you know... Absolutely. And, and still looking good. 
Uh, Marco, I'm afraid we're going to have to cut you short because it's because we have to move on to the next demo. Oh, yeah. But it's always good having you on On the Spot. Yes, thank um, you. So very thank much you, Marco here. Georgievich, for showing us the Metal Gear Solid HD collection um, out this coming Tuesday yep. on the PS Triple and the Xbox 360. Um, but uh, you're not the only demo today. We're going to move on to another one. This is a tape demo. We've got some Need for Speed The Run to show you. So without further ado, let's go on over and take a look. All right, everybody, it's demo time, and right now we're going to have a look at Need for Speed The Run, which just comes out in a few short weeks, and I'm joined by Jason DeLong, the executive producer on the title. Jason, How thanks a lot for sitting down in these nice red chairs My and pleasure. showing off some Need for Speed. Um, so we've actually got the game right here, so as we uh, unpause here, why don't you uh, give everybody an introduction to The Run for anybody out there who might not be familiar with it. Sure, well, Need for Speed The Run is about an illicit high-stakes cross-country race from San Francisco to New York. It's uh, the first time in Need for Speed history that we've actually gone through real locations, actually. In the past, we've always created sort of a fictional county or city and, and, and been inspired by some great, uh, some great places in the U.S., but have never actually recreated them. So as you're seeing here, we're in... Uh, what we're calling the Great Lakes area. This is just outside of Chicago, so sort of a um, wisconsin -y kind of vibe, the farmlands. Uh, Jack is uh, Jack Rourke, our hero, is, is uh, basically just, just gotten out of Chicago, and if you, you were at E3, you saw some of the, uh, the peril that Jack gets himself into it in, in Chicago. So this is kind of uh, the morning after, and Jack's back in the race. Uh, this is a run event, so we're in the run right now. Um, Jack's in 25th position, as you see, uh, and his goal in this event is to actually get uh, ahead of eight uh, eight racers. It's kind of one of the one of the, the primary mechanics of the game, uh, of the run, is, is that you're actually passing a certain number of racers as you're as you're going across. Because obviously you need to get from you know 205th to first by the time you get to New York. Right. Okay. And uh, we're in the the higher tier cars now as well. Oh, uh -oh. my, my demoer had some uh, had some problems <laughs> there. Uh, so obviously you got some wreck treatments in this game as well, which we're pretty proud of. But um, and this actually is a good thing to bring up as well, the, the checkpoint reset. So what we wanted to do with the run was uh, have almost the concept of lives in each race, like a, similar to a Mario game or an arcade game, where um, you, know, you have a chance to actually retry something if you, if you fail. It's not a case of, well, you wrecked, you've got to start the race all over again. We wanted right. to make sure that people were feeling like they had a chance to um, you know, try again. So if you're playing on normal difficulty, you actually get five checkpoint resets. And th what those resets do is they actually allow you to um, go back to a previous checkpoint and, and continue on. And you can initiate those yourselves as a user if you feel like, mm -hmm. oh, you know what, I could have taken that corner a little bit faster. Um, you can do it yourself, or as you just saw, if you, if you get wrecked, you can actually uh, you get reset to, to the previous checkpoint in the game. All right, and now one of the things that's most immediately noticeable about this game is that it looks quite nice. <laughs> It has, and, it has uh, some, some visuals, for it, sure. it, ha it definitely has some, some impressive visuals. And um, for anybody out there who might uh, be playing Battlefield 3 right now, there's sort of a reason for there that, right? There are some similarities, yeah. We're actually uh, on the Frostbite 2 engine, which was developed uh, by DICE, uh, who made Battlefield 3, as most of you probably know by now. Um, and we worked with, with our partners at DICE to get you know, our driving and physics engine and handling model into uh, Frostbite 2 in order to, to really hit on uh, a lot of these visuals that, that we're trying to hit with the run and really ex sell this journey and this expansive race across the U.S. Uh, I've kind of said in the past that it, it would have been very easy for us to just sort of recreate five cities mm -hmm. and, and string them together and say you made it across the country, but really for us, the, the journey across the country from San Francisco to New York and the variety of the terrain that you're going to see is, is really critical to, to selling this journey. And, and uh, one of the things that we, we noted in one of our other events recently was actually that in a lot of racing games, you're racing the same place over and over and over again to get faster and faster cars. The run uh, story mode is actually more about, you've already got great cars, uh -huh. it's you're, you're playing and racing and racing to get further ahead and see more of the terrain and see more of the U.S. as you cross it, because uh, that's really what the journey's about. It's not about the cities, it's about the, the places in between the cities. So as you just saw, you know, going through this rural farmland area is a huge part of what, what America is, is, is based on. So the fact that we could recreate it quite faithfully and, and beautifully um, is awesome. Frostbite gives us, um, an immense, uh, power, immensely powerful tool in terms of content creation. We were able to do over 300 kilometers of track uh, in the game, which is oh, wow. um, more than three times you've seen in any previous Need for Speed before. So it really is this epic journey across the country. All right, so that was a, a run event. Now we're going to go ahead and uh, quit out and check out another different game mode in, uh, in Need for Speed The Run. All right, now through a little movie-making magic, we've got another mode queued up here. And uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce us to what we're about to see? Yeah, so this is our, our new challenge series mode. So we've been talking a lot about the run and how it's what this, the story mode and the cross-country race. But that's actually only one-third of the game. We've actually got a whole other single-player mode 
uh, which is our challenge series. And what that is is uh, locations inspired by the locations you visited in the run, but new gameplay mechanics within them. Um, similar to what you played in Hot Pursuit, different event types mm -hmm. uh, against different races, time attacks, things like that. The one we're going to show here is uh, set in the uh, Independence Pass area, which was the, the one of the levels that we showed off at Gamescom this year. Um, this is one of the one of the uh, tracks in that set in that stage, uh, and this is actually a time attack battle. So it's kind of a classic checkpoint race where you're basically it's you uh, against the track trying to get through the uh, through the checkpoints within a time period. And uh, this is actually one of the more epic races in the game. It's it's a huge battle up through the Rocky Mountains. It takes you know a good five six minutes uh, of, of checkpoint racing here. Cool thing about the challenge series is that it is there's over 70 of them in the game. So in addition to all the events that we have obviously in the run and, and all the events the, the the races across America, mm -hmm. we have the challenge series as well. And there's um, there's 10 unique stages. Oh, uh -oh. Ryan's, Ryan's <laughs> going off the track. <laughs> in fairness, he was driving on ice. Just that's then. true. Yeah, that's one of the challenges of the track. But uh, uh, but we do have um, yeah we've got over 70 different uh, unique events in the challenge series, and you're competing for medals, and and you're also competing. Uh, to beat your friends. One of the things that's great about the Challenge Series, much like the run, but in a, in a different way, is that uh, we've integrated Autolog, and for those mm -hmm. that don't know Autolog, it's kind of our, our social competition feature that was pioneered by Criterion in Hot Pursuit, and uh, we've taken it a little bit further with, um, with the run this year. The idea being that uh, you know, you're competing asynchronously against your friends, so uh, unfortunately the, the console we're playing on isn't connected, and, and Brian sadly has no friends, so uh, we can't... <laughs> Brian. Uh, yeah, Brian. Yeah, well, we like to beat up on Brian a little bit. But, uh, so what, what happens you actually know second to second as you're racing through this event how you're doing against your friends. Previous games like uh, in Hot Pursuit, for example, there were checkpoints, and when you mm -hmm. crossed a checkpoint, it said, okay, now you're two seconds ahead or, or four seconds behind your friends, whereas we actually have a real-time updating HUD uh, that every tenth of a second, essentially, is showing you how you're comparing, so you know that on a given corner if a friend actually shaves some time off. Uh, it gets incredibly addictive as you see that number kind of go from red because you're you know minus mm -hmm. a second and you get closer and closer and closer and it turns green and you're ahead by you know a tenth or two tenths of a second and then all of a sudden you can go around a corner and it goes back to red because you know that guy took a, took the corner a little faster than you did. It's actually pretty addictive. So um, it's the thing that keeps us at the office a lot later than it should right now. The game's done, but we're still playing it until two, two or three in the morning <laughs> trying to beat each other's times. So uh, it's a it's a great uh, additional feature to the game. Yeah, th that sort of answers one of the questions I was going to ask you before, which is that you know in a typical uh, race uh, career mode, you're sort of replaying the same tracks over and over and you're just trying to get to know each corner and shave as much time off as you can, but in a run environment, you're going from city to city and you don't really repeat those same places. Yeah, so exactly. this is where you're like encouraging people to shave time off their... Exactly right, yeah. The, the whole idea is that the, the career mode, the story mode of the run is, is really an adventure, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, a racing game is a racing game um, where you're competing just sort of against yourself or against your friends, but when you added the, when we added in the character and the story, it it's really becomes an adventure, and, and that's what the run is all about, is that point-to-point -point racing from the west coast to the east coast as quickly mm -hmm. as you can, whereas this is really for the racing purists. These are the people that really want uh, to, like you say, shave hundreds of seconds off the tracks, and uh, the nice thing is that because we did create such a huge, expansive amount of track for the run, we can reuse it in different and creative ways in the challenge series, so you're going to see you know, tracks that you raced um, you know, in one direction, obviously, and going, going from west to east in the run, uh, maybe you're going to race it in reverse, and maybe it was a sprint race when you did it in, um, in the run, and now it's a, cha a time attack challenge like you're seeing here, or a rival battle. Uh, and maybe the tr during the run we, we set it during the day, but you know, when you do it in the challenge series it's at night, or it's in the middle of a dust storm, or a fog bank, or whatever. Right. So the idea is that we can actually reuse the tracks in kind of a creative and interesting way. So it's a new experience from a driving perspective, and it's also a different type of racing. So, um, you know, anytime you're showing a driving game, you always get those questions from the hardcore racing fans, which is, how, how does the driving feel? What's the handling model? Can you, can you talk about how the cars feel in this game and then what would be the closest point of comparison in the Need for Speed series in terms of you know how the cars yeah, feel on the road. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't know if there is a if there's a direct comparison to anything we've really done before. I mean, we've we've at Black Box we've been doing a lot of Need for Speeds over the years. This is the first one we've done in a, in a few years. Actually, mm -hmm. we've had a good three years to really work on the concept and and also to work on really the uh, work on our engine and work with Frostbite and, and and really kind of reinvigorate our physics and handling model and and uh, the goal for us always with in, in the creation of the run was was to make the cars behave believably, for mm -hmm. lack of a better word, which is really that um, you know it's not. If you, if you get behind the wheel of a you know thousand horsepower Pagani like this and you floor <laughs> yeah. it on ice, you know you're probably not going to be too successful. <laughs> we didn't want it to go to that extreme of, right. of uh, you know doing three donuts and smashing into a wall and dying. <laughs> However, at the same time, we we didn't want them to be um, 
so arcadey that you could you know execute a perfect drift around a corner the very first time you got behind the wheel. So they're definitely uh, easy to pick up and play. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, but there is a real feel to them. And when when you feel like it's starting to break loose, you know that it's starting to break loose, and you do have to kind of fight to gain a little bit of control back again. So there is a really nice balance uh, between arcade and sim. We're not full arcade. We're not as far over as, as Hot Pursuit was, for example. Mm -hmm. But we're definitely not in the shift or Forza realm. We're we're, we're sort of somewhere in between. And and you know, early reports are that people are really enjoying the handling in terms of uh, it does present you know a bit of a unique challenge. It's it's immediately accessible and easy to pick up and, and enjoy mm -hmm. but at the same time there's definitely some some mastering required and uh, you know a mode like the challenge series is a great way to kind of practice and learn that and uh, and you'll see as people get better and better at the cars their times are going to get better and better as well all right and the third area that uh, we're not showing here uh, live obviously because we're not connected but um, the third thing we're, we're sort of talking about now is we're unveiling our multiplayer uh, for oh, the right which is uh, we decided to do something a little bit different uh, in that we wanted it to to feel like a very much um, like a drop-in uh, me methodology for, for multiplayer. So mm -hmm. we don't have the, the concept of a lobby. Essentially, we have a series of, of playgroups. There's six playgroups, and there's over 80 unique race events within those themed playgroups. So we have, for example, an undercover playgroup, which is you know tuner-type cars at night. We have the American Muscle Car one, which is more about kind of flat-out desert racing in American Muscle Cars. And the idea being that uh, all of these themed events and, and, and themed races, you can just sort of drop into a playgroup right away and you're, you're, you're placed in the race kind of behind the last place person. And the whole idea is that it's not always about finishing first. You're actually getting experience points and accolades for everything you do <clears throat> as you're racing through the game. So you, we've got uh, a huge suite of multiplayer features that uh, we'll be you know, getting more detail about in the, in the coming weeks. But uh, the idea being that we really want to make sure that people are playing both the run and challenge mode as a single player and competing against their friends from an autolog perspective, but also playing our multiplayer and, uh, and seeing kind of the third, the third tier of, of our game. So we're, we're really excited to, to bring it out in a couple weeks. All right, excellent. Uh, well, Jason, thanks a lot for dropping by. I appreciate you coming uh, into the studio and showing us Need for Speed The Run. My Can you go ahead and remind everybody out there when the game is going to be out in stores and you the platforms betcha. it'll be out for? Yeah, we're going to see The Run uh, out on November 15th in North America, and that's going to be on your Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, PC, uh, Wii, 3DS, and we're also going to have some uh, iOS versions coming out soon, too. All right, cool. Sounds good. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. There you have it, everybody. That was your demo for Need, Need for Speed The Run. Now on with the rest of the show. Thank you, Sean McInnes. Um, that was um, yesterday, Sean McInnes, or earlier this week, Sean McInnes, but we're now back in the present, and I am here with Maxwell McGee. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's interesting, we were watching that Need for Speed, the run. I didn't see um, any running. Preview. Where was the running? I didn't running? see any running. The other thing, though, is I said, wow, this game is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And you said, what? <laughs> because you thought I was I talking no about your game. I had no idea what you were talking your about. Your game. I thought um, we were talking about Serious Sam. The random encounter. Okay, now first of all, how awesome is that for a name for a Serious <laughs> Sam game? Well, you had you had the first encounter, then you had the second encounter, and then this one's just the random encounter. But why? It, but it's not just because it's cute that it's called <laughs> the random encounter. There's also there's also a reason because we're I not think, looking at a typical Serious Sam game. It's not your typical Serious Sam game. It is a sort of light-hearted, bite-sized uh, role-playing game. As a matter of fact. Well, why don't we go ahead and take a look and see what this game is all sure about? Thing. And uh, you made a comparison earlier too to to say that. This game sort of reminds you of, of Half Minute Hero, and why, why is that? Yeah, so it kind of gives me a Half Minute Hero vibe because as you can see up here in the, uh, the top corner of the screen, I have, a, uh, I have a series of lives. So every time you enter a new map, like I've just entered this, this dungeon here, um, it, the game creates a checkpoint. And so if I die in here, I'll, I'll lose a life, I'll start back you know, wherever I started my, uh, my random encounter, and I can uh, go again. And if I die three times, then I have to start the whole area over again. Okay, but so you've got three dudes in your party here. I do have three dudes in my party. I got pick out. I'm gonna use my rocket launcher. And you're not only just choosing what weapon you want them to use, but you actually chose um, an aim. Yeah. So you can do all sorts of stuff here. So I got Sam. He's he's rolling with the minigun because he's awesome, and that's what he do. I've got my uh, my, my nameless Afro gentleman here. He's uh, rolling with the uh, the dual revolvers. And then finally, we've got the cowboy that I just picked up. He's got the rocket launcher, and I'm gonna adjust the cone a little bit here. Um, different weapons have different properties. Oh, if people get too close to you like you did just there, you, uh, you melee them, but you lose some, some health and armor. But I'll get back to the, the battle system in just a second. So back here on the overworld map, like I said, you have lives. Um, you you want to get down to a little exit there at the bottom of the screen. It'll you know take a couple of minutes. You got item boxes. Boom, I got a laser rifle. Slows enemies down. Extremely helpful. So OK, so here we are back in combat. As you can see, I've got my three guys. Um, so obviously, Serious Sam, it's all about running backwards and shooting dudes. Sure. So in this game, you run backwards and you shoot just tons of dudes. Right now, we're shooting fish and we're shooting headless gunsmen. Uh, and you, uh, 
you have an impressive arsenal of weapons, all of the classic uh, serious Sam shoot 'em up items. So, like I said, yeah, Sam, he's on his minigun. You can uh, you can adjust the uh, the trajectory, we'll say, of the bullets if you want to do sort of in a, a diagonal line here. Something I like to do is we'll set him diagonally. We'll go ahead and leave him on revolvers because these are pretty simple enemies. And we'll swap the cowboy over to the laser gun, which also lets me adjust the trajectory. And we can create sort of an X pattern here that'll that'll soak up the enemies and create an impenetrable passageway there. So Maxwell, I hear that we have a special guest in our yeah. chat room. Really? Um, and she um, and she's griefing you. And that guest is oh, what? Um, X GameSpot editor Sophia Tong. Oh, X GameSpot now GR Sophia Tong. Is, yes. she, is she giving me the business? Now on Games Radar. I don't know what she's saying, but if you had <laughs> anything that you could say to Sophia Tong right now, what would it mean? I'd like to see Sophia Tong do better at Serious Sam the Random Encounter. This game takes skills. As you can see, I can move my party up and down on the screen to dodge projectiles. I can't go backwards and forwards. You only go backwards because it's Serious Sam. You got to run backwards and shoot dudes. Right. A quick note here. Uh, so you get this victory screen. Sure. I get some health. I get some armor. Um, that depends on sort of like your performance, how quickly you get through the fight. And that'll get added to your, your character's life bars now at the bottom. Um, so if you don't take a whole lot of damage, you can, uh, you can stack the armor bonuses on there and gradually work your way up to 100 out of 100 armor, which I have right now. And then you also, you don't level up, but when that meter fills up, you, uh, the game will give you items like here. I just got a, the serious speed boost, which uh, makes you run faster for a limited amount of time. Also picked up a revive there. And we're gonna go back into another fight. I'm gonna pick out, I'm gonna do some shotgun, leave you on revolvers, and a little minigun action. So Max, um, somebody wants to know if the, the game has any co-op play. Uh, no, no, the game is is single player only, unfortunately. Yeah, it does strike me that this this formula isn't necessarily one that that's. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. A, it's a role playing game, and you unfortunately don't see a lot of like role playing. Oh look, my Afro guy, his hair got all wet, so he's a little upset. This game has virtually like no story or setup. Um, basically, oh here we go. Basically, they were just like, we need to send Sirius Sam into the future so he can what fight the bad dudes, and then Sirius Sam goes into the future. He meets the dude with the afro, he meets the cowboy a little later on, and they're just, just shooting bad dudes. So what kind of enemies are we going to see? We, we see the enemies here. Now, some of these uh, represent classic Sirius Sam enemies. Yeah, a couple are, of these enemies I recognize, a couple of them I don't, but I'm a little, I'm a little low on, oh goodness, I'm getting tore up on my Sirius Sam trivia. But obviously, like the dudes in the purple shirts, those are your, your random shooter enemies that you always see in Sirius Sam games. They have uh, the headless kamikaze troopers are in this game as well. The, uh, the big yellow dudes with the uh, the Gatling guns on their arms that are oh chewing me up. I need something. I need a little extra oomph. I'm gonna stick. Wait, he's on revolvers. When did that? When happen? you say dude, you mean like Scorpo dude? Yeah, scor yellow Scorpo Gatling gun dude. I'm gonna hit up the rocket launcher here, and then we got the mini gun. So I don't know that I've ever been clear on whether these these oh. actually have official names. Oh my gosh! I know, I know. I just got steamrolled. So I think we're gonna have to bust out the serious bomb. You have a lot of items that can give you an edge in battle. You got heals, you got armory, you got speed like we talked about. And you, you have got like the bomb. a phoenix down? Kaboom! You do have a phoenix down, you have revives. Um, the bomb just wipes everybody out. Uh, and then, as you can see down there, my cowboy, it says win, and for Sam and the Afro gentleman, it says cry, because they totally got murder death. And now, here we are at the exit. And hooray! You got a score. Now, Maxwell McGee, we are looking at what looks like pretty kind of a, a console style RPG, but it is on the PC. It is on the PC. It's a, it came out last week, I believe, and it's on Steam. It's only like five bucks, so you've got no reason to go check it out. It's super cute and fun. And anything you wanted to point out about the uh, the battle system, anything that, uh, that really strikes you as, hey, this is unique and different, and this is this is why you should play Serious Sam the Random Encounter. I mean, like, I, like you saw in the battle system, it is turn-based, but it's also got some real-time moments in there, too. You have to move your character around to, like, dodge projectiles and switch weapons and all that. So if you don't just, like, sitting back in your, your role-playing games and just watching the action happen, this one, it's cheap, and you get to, like, you get to have a little real-time action in there as well. Well, thanks so much for showing us Serious Sam the Random Encounter, Maxwell McGee. You're present Maxwell McGee, but it, I'm stuck here. It turns out that past Maxwell McGee <laughs> um, had a had a chat with somebody at Trader Run in. I had a run in with the Rift guys. You do. So why don't we go ahead and take a look and see what you talk to uh, talk to them about Rift about? Um, so let's take a look at Rift. Is it? Uh, I think it's a 1.6 up. Ember Isle. Yes. There we go. Rift Ember Isle. Take it away, past Maxwell. Hey everybody, Maxwell McGee here, and today I'm joined by Simon Finch, Design Director on Rift, a high fantasy MMO that launched earlier this year. 
Now, Simon, I understand today we're going to be taking the wrapper off of update 1.6. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. And anybody that has been playing the game knows that we like to deliver content on a rapid basis. And not only that, a huge amounts of content. And, and today is no exception. Yeah, this game, it's, it's not even a year old yet. And already you guys are up to 1.6. I imagine you're just working triple overtime back home to get all this stuff done. It's a pretty feverish pace, yes, it is. All right, so I know we've got a lot of stuff to cover. So why don't we jump straight into the gameplay here and check it out. So where are we right now? So we are here on Ember Isle. This is uh, the first entire new zone that we're actually delivering. So this is the biggest zone in the entire game so far. Um, it is about twice the size of, of uh, most of our other zones mm -hmm. out there. Not only is it uh, huge in actual surface area, there are also lots of sort of uh, caverns to discover and uh, underground areas. So it's multi-layered. Um, it is uh, the home of the Kalari, so uh, the Defiants that are the Kalari, uh, the Kalari on the Defiant side, they have come back here to sort of rediscover their roots. Uh, also, there is a, a tribe of dwarves here that have uh, came here as an expedi expedition many, many years ago and have, mm -hmm. have gone native. Uh, so that gives the Defiance, the dwarves on the Defiant side, uh, a reason to come over here and to discover what's going on there. And they, uh, the key thing about this place as well is it's also where Malforge, the uh, fire dragon, is imprisoned. Um, there was a group of people called the Keepers here that are the ones that are uh, maintaining that prison and making sure that Malforge doesn't escape. And uh, the, uh, uh, fail, the, um, the Golden Moor, thank you. The Golden Moor cultists of Earth and the uh, Wanton, mm -hmm. the cultists of Fire, have actually grouped together and they are here to try and actually free Malforge. Um, and and uh, I, I get the feeling they're, they're probably going to succeed, aren't they? I mean, if we're just being honest. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not going to tell you that. Okay, we'll have fine. to let you. You we'll can come here and actually find out. out. Yes. So there was uh, there was a, a, a large story for each of the two factions to find out, um, and then there was also a sort of shared uh, experience as well. Okay. Um, there's a whole new type of gameplay for players to uh, get into here. It's uh, called we call it onslaught. It is kind of like a defense type of game. Uh, there are areas that you can actually um, upgrade defensive towers and uh, um, offensive towers. And once you start doing that, you'll end up getting waves and waves of creatures from the plains coming in to try and take over the place. Um, I have had a lot of fun actually coming across these things and discovering them taken over by the plane of water, say, mm -hmm. and I want to see if I can figure out how to take it back. Okay. Uh, that's. Um, you know, not too bad if you've got a lot of players helping you, but with these uh, upgradable uh, defensive and offensive positions, it's actually possible to do it solo as well, which is a, an entertaining challenge. Um, particularly when you might get then, say, the, the plane of fire might come in, and they you can then sort of play the two planes off against each other. and. So it sort of turns into a three-way struggle. Exactly. There's sort of like definitely some strategy in, in taking these places back. Yep. So um, as I said, we, we like to deliver a lot of content. So as well as uh, an entire new zone, we're also, um, uh, you know, this is actually coming out mid-November. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be delivering this whole zone, uh, a brand new dungeon. It will be the first new five-man dungeon we've delivered. Uh, the dungeon is so big that it is actually uh, two possible scenarios can take place. So you can you can queue up for normal dungeon. Players will know what I mean uh, who are playing Rift right now using the looking for group. Mm -hmm. um, and there are two versions. Uh, you're looking at it here as Kadusha's Rise. Um, and a little bit further down the line, we will be introducing an expert version that is actually both of those combined into one massive experience. So this is truly a huge free roaming dungeon. Uh, 10 bosses, I believe, have I got that right? Um, so uh, not only the biggest zone, uh, now here is the biggest dungeon. When I started playing this on Alpha, and maybe this is a hint to any pl uh, people that are watching this, I'll give you a little heads up, that it is definitely worth investing some of your planar attunement points in the ability to carry more planar charges. You'll find that very a little, useful. A little nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Thing. Definitely a little bit of insider information there. I, I'll tell you that, that my character that I play on Life has certainly been spending quite a bit of time spending my uh, attunement points being able to carry more planar charges. What you use to to do the upgrades. 
Um, so we're actually going to show you part of uh, one of the new events here. Uh, I'm not going to show you the whole thing. As players will know, these can be quite involved and, and uh, take quite a bit of time. So what is the what is the setup to this event? We'll say lore wise. Uh, this particular event is uh, a fire based event. This is actually, um, whoops, there he is, um, a huge dragon called Sirion mm -hmm. that um, has been unleashed on. Uh, the world. In fact, the, the, the sort of like the story, as I mentioned before, this is where Malforge, the, the fire dragon, is actually imprisoned. And there is a contingent of um, uh, cultists that are trying to break the, the prison and, and free him. Mm -hmm. So in, the, um, in their attempts to do that, various other things will happen. And this is one of the things that, okay. can, that, that can happen. There are, um, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I don't want to give away <laughs> the whole story and let the players discover it as they, they come here and, and play. But um, it is, there's a giant volcano, as you can see in the middle, and um, yeah, dragon and a volcano. Who can't love Some that? Some ominous signs. <laughs> yeah. <indeed. laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the things we also discovered as we've been sort of like releasing content over, over these last few months mm -hmm. is um, that we, we produce a giant, great big uh, content package and then release it to the players. It got a little bit overwhelming. And the last time, we tried something new where we actually spread it out over a little bit of a longer time. And we sort of like had the initial drop and then would sort of follow it up with smaller drops of content. And we're going to uh, do that model again because that, that seemed to be received well. So okay. some of the things that are coming right after the, the three things that I talked about, the zone and the, the dungeon and the raid, mm -hmm. is we're also um, an entire new gameplay mode called Instant Adventure is coming, which actually allows players to either jump in solo and then start sort of like a giant Zerg rolling. It's a way of almost uh, putting uh, zone events type of gameplay into the player's control. They can start this thing going. Other people will join. It's a similar sort of uh, UI to the looking for group. Um, so and the content scales depending on how many people join in. So you can also join if you just happen to see the Zerg running by. You can just jump in and join just the same way with the, the public grouping that we have. Um, so that's coming soon after. And then, how release. many of these these uh, these instant adventures can be happening? Uh, it's once. very much that that is a very casual gameplay. It's jump in, join for a time, do some objectives that get uh, given to you and the group. The objectives uh, vary depending on how many people are in in the um, group. Um, and then when you've had enough leave, it's like we we didn't want to make it feel like you know you join this group and people are going to be mad at you if you drop out. So it's not like a, like a war front or a dungeon where you've got this commitment to these people that you uh, grouped up with to to finish it out. It's very much join, have some fun, kill then, some stuff, get some loot, collect some things. When you're done, you're I'm done. done. I'm done. I'm out of here for a bit, guys. Thanks. Maybe I'll see you later. You okay. Know, so. Um, and then that's not the only thing that's coming. That's not later the only thing. Online, We're it? also our first um, mobile app is coming out, which okay. is actually coming out for uh, Android and um, iPhone. Um, that will allow you to chat to your guild uh, while they're online and you're sort of secretly at work <laughs> or something. Uh, there's also some um, what we're calling um, loot cards. So you can get some you know, crafting materials, in-game items, artifacts and stuff like that for um, you know, little daily mini games, maybe. Okay. Um, so like you play the, the mini games yeah. in the app and then you're awarded these cards and that one you can of, redeem in the game? Yes. Okay. Yes. And one of the coolest things, what I'm really looking forward to is actually also notification of when certain zone events are happening. You can set it up to say, hey, I want to know if any zone event fires off in Gloamwood. Uh, let me know when that's happening, and uh, you know, I can duck out and log on. And, um, so at 3 o'clock in the morning, when the phone starts vibrating on the nightstand, you know, like, oh, no. Absolutely. The they planes are help. calling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you better go and uh, yeah, defeat the plane of fire that's now attacking Free March. Um, so that's coming too. All right, Simon. Well, I think that's just about going to do it for us. I know you you hinted on the uh, the release earlier in the uh, in the interview, but can you go ahead and remind right, but, us? When uh, mid November. Mid November is when the rollout will start, and that's when the uh, players will get access to the new zone, the new dungeon, and, and the raid, and the other stuff will follow uh, periodically All after right. that. Well, thank you so much for stopping by and showing off the uh, the new content. You're welcome. And thank you guys at home for watching, and be sure to stay tuned to Gamespot.com for more coverage. 
Thank you, past Maxwell McGee. Yeah, I We're, think I did an excellent job. You did an excellent so job. So. I'm a big fan of Rift, so it was really good to see <laughs> Again, some of that stuff. It does look really nice. I know. And uh, we're back with present Maxwell McGee. You are still playing Serious Sam the Random Encounter. I'm still working on Serious Sam the Random Encounter because this game's totally rad, and I just made it to the sewer boss of the area I was in. I got to get out my rocket launcher real quick here. I know you guys are excited to get to the next segment, but look at this dude. He's got what? Well, he's got crazy tentacles, Tentacle. and he's, he's trying to murder death me, and I'm shooting rockets. Oh, what the at heck him. is that? He's got it's his tiny fish mouth that produces other tiny fishes with their own tiny fish mouths, and it's gross. I'm just gonna hit him with rockets and Gatling guns. I actually, when I first started playing this game, like I didn't know that you could actually move your characters up and down. Oh, really? So when I got to this boss and came, oh no! You see, he stabs you with that tentacle thing. I would just stand there like a doofus <laughs> and let him just steamroll my characters one, two, three with his tentacles, and it was awful. Oh, these murder death fish are killing me. So use a, a I was gonna say use a special item of some type. I know, I'm gonna use my speed. I gotta get some distance, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stack that with my revive to bring my Afro dude back. Okay, okay, we can breathe easy. But I think we got another segment. I'm going to keep working on this. Yeah, keep working on that because apparently Aaron Sampson has something he wants to tell us. He wants to tell us about this week's digital downloads. Aaron Sampson, tell us what we need to know. What's up, Game Spotters? This is Aaron Sampson bringing you a list of top digital downloads this week on Xbox Live, PlayStation Network, and Wii Shop channel. New this week on Wii Shop, let's be honest, your backyard's already a plant ghetto, so you might as well start fighting gnomes there. Entry fee is 1G's worth of Wii points. Gnomes with a Z, because gnomes are now gangsta, allows four players to battle platform against one another across 25 arenas. Use power-ups including flying elephants and deadly rainbows to dominate your pint-sized foes. New on XBLA, it's Burger Time World Tour for 800 Microsoft points. Make burgers in this puzzle plate uh, former by stepping on their ingredients. Ugh, that can't be sanitary. Burger Time now has online or split-screen multiplayer if you were looking for that. Old but newly available this week on PSN, are you afraid of the water? Uh, then that's really bad for you, since your body is more than half of the old two hydrogens and one oxygen. But if that's the case, you can download Hydrophobia Prophecy for $9.99 and just call it Cheap Therapy. Hydrophobia Prophecy is an overhaul of the 6.5 scoring Xbox Live Arcade release. The remake already bumped up the score to a 7.5 for the PC release in May, so prospects are pretty good for the PS3. Improvements include better water physics, new mechanics, tighter controls, and better presentation. After that, let your pen be your guide in Max and the Magic Marker Gold Edition for $9.99. Magic Marker is a physics-based puzzle platformer that lets you get into trouble and then draw your way out. There's a free trial if you want to put your penmanship to the test. This game also allows you to finally tell your grandmother, No grandma, not all games are violent. Now eat your peas or you go to bed hungry. Next, standing in the left corner from 2008, weighing in at a score of 7.5, it's Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe for $19.99. Smash your opponents through walls as you move between arenas, or you know, just play as the Joker. Because he's awesome. Staying in the DC Universe fighting vein, check out DC Universe Online free to play for free. That's why it's free to play. Kind of like debit card fees from Bank of America, the monthly charges have been dropped. We scored the title a 7.0 good, so if you want to battle through Metropolis and Gotham City, your wallet sure ain't stopping you. On XBL this week, for $29.99, Marvel vs. Capcom 3 brings together a cast full of nostalgia. I could say more, but I'd rather let you watch this raccoon drop some bombs. I love the smell of napalm in the Finally this week, you'd be doing yourself a favor to check out the 8.0 great scoring Enslaved Odyssey to the West for $19.99. The title follows the adventures of Monkey, voiced by Andy Serkis, who did Golem, and Trip, a technologically savvy young woman with questionable methods as they flee their new robot overlords. Or, you know, just bash them to death. Either way. In game demos this week on XBL, you should check out Raving Rabbids Alive and Kicking and Grease Dance. Both XBL and PSN this week let you get wacky with Saints Row the Third Initiation Station that lets you make some ridiculous characters to import into the title when it's released on November 15th. In new DLC this week, PSN has Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception add-ons ranging from 49 cents to 9.99, and SOCOM 4 US Navy SEALs gets the EVAC co-op pack for 7.99. On XBL, you're going to want to get your hands on the Horde Command Pack for Gears of War 3, 800 Microsoft points. 
and you don't have to pay at all for the Exterminatus downloadable content for Warhammer 40,000 Space Marine. Both consoles have the Batman Arkham City Nightwing bundle for $6.99 or 560 Microsoft points. In game trailers this week on PSN, check out the XCOM Dev Diary 1. And for XBL, feel free to watch the beginning trailer for Skylander Spyro's Adventure, the Horde Command Pack trailer for Gears of War 3, and the Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary trailer. That's all the time we have. Join us next week for our top picks of digital downloads. All right, we're back. Um, I learned two really important things from that segment from Aaron. What Sands. is that, Kevin? I learned number one that one million dollars times zero is zero. That's some Aaron that, Samson math. That is Aaron right Samson there. math. And you know what else I learned? What? Curlers are hot. Oh, baby. Absolutely. I should have uh, put some curlers in before I came up. Uh, you don't need it. You got the most beautiful hair on earth. We all oh, know this God. already. All right, but speaking of what's hot, yes. Battlefield 3 is hot. It's blowing up. Yeah, and so we've got some information on how you can excel, you, you can excel at Battlefield 3. Let's go ahead and take a look at our starting block so that you can get caught up and not trip over your words like I'm doing such a good job of. Take it away. All right, we are here with Kelly. Kelly, uh, she is a pro gamer. <laughs> yes. Are we allowed to say that? I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, why, what, how, you are a resident pro for this segment. Why are we considering you a resident pro? Well, I'm one of the only females that have, you know, made a living off pro gaming. Okay, I know, what, what's your game? That. What are your games? Right now, it is Battlefield, because it's about to come out, right, obviously. obviously. Going to train for that 1.6. And then um, my main game, though, is Gears of War. Gears of War. Mm -hmm. And uh, you I have history that. playing, I assume, lots of other games, Halo, Halo 2. Oh, yeah, Black Any Ops. anything with a gun in it, for sure. So that's good, because the thing about Battlefield is uh, this isn't really a pro gamer's game. No. Nobody actually pays you. Well, maybe there's some fool out there paying you, but probably <laughs> not. Um, not right now. But the skills are transferable, so if mm -hmm. you want to be good in the competitive multiplayer component, um, you know, she can help you. And she's going to help you right now. Easy. So Easy money. Easy money. Probably easy not money. money. But <laughs> we are going to play a little bit of Battlefield 3. Okay. You are going to tell us a little bit about how, if I'm new to the game, you know, I just picked up Battlefield 3, what are the good first steps? What should I do? Like, what, okay. let's start off with, um, okay, this is my first match. What should I do in my first match? All righty, so basically what you want to do in Battlefield is secure vehicles, and as you can see, most of our vehicles are gone. Mm -hmm. So our teammates took care of that. But you definitely want to learn how to sprint because you're going to be doing a lot of that, which right. on the 360, it's just so simple, L stick, and you click it in. Um, also, you want to learn how to scope in. Right. That's the biggest essential I think Battlefield users use as well as crouch. Rawr. Just randomly go prone. Why not? Yes. Why not? It improves your accuracy. You know, has it makes it a little harder for everyone else to see you. Mm -hmm. So that's always a good thing. All right. Um, switching weapons. Switching weapons obviously. in case you need Why? to use a pistol. Which you you use pistol a lot actually in Battlefield. People don't think you do, but you you can whip some tail with the pistol yeah. any day, just because right. it's so accurate. Oh. And yeah. That makes sense. Okay, so right now your class is assault. assault. Is mm -hmm. that is that probably the preferred class for someone starting out? I would say so. You know, assault is that run run and gun, get to the objective, mm -hmm. get in there and do your work. Um, and as far as learning a game, that's what you want to do. You want right. to get in there and learn the map very quickly, faster than everyone else. So I always suggest also playing an objective-based game first, too. And like, um, as far as running around, that probably means that you're going to be ignoring people a lot. A little bit. For the first couple games, sure, you know, absolutely. Ignore a few people, you know, just get, get to the objective itself. Figure out where. And figure out where the H you need to go. Okay. Um, just had a guy shoot at me. So, as an assault, you've got a weapon here. Is this the one that you're going to, I think it's the AK-47M? This is the M4. Oh, the M4. Yeah. Um, this would be the M4 on this side. See this tank out here? Yeah. No, no one you're out. Just gonna I'm just going to lob a grenade at it. I'm a little scared of him right now. Can you actually take out a tank with a grenade? Uh, it takes a couple. You can definitely blind him. You can grenade. definitely knife a fence, and it breaks, <laughs> and there's some random dude in front of me. Worth killing. Whoa! Worth killing. Um, Worth okay. killing for sure. So the the M the M4 is a good See good weapon it. to start with. What what's good about it? <laughs> it's extremely accurate. As you just saw, all I had to do was put a few into the guy's chest, and he was already dead. Mm -hmm. So the damage is also high as well. Mm -hmm. But 
Okay. And then so this game obviously has upgrades. What do you think oh, would absolutely. be a good first couple of upgrades for this gun? Um, I'd say the red dot. Anything red dot because red totally sticks out when you're um, shooting other people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Farther away, you can still see your dot as well as see the other person. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't hurt, and it but it totally it totally helps. Doesn't hurt, but helps. Okay. And I really just want to get away from this tank right uh, here. That would make sense. Um, He's scaring me. But. <laughs> Vehicles obviously are big in this game. Um, huge in this game. Huge in this game. Huge, you guys don't even know. If I'm just starting out, should I hop in a vehicle? Like, should I get in that big uh, jet? It's probably going to be a, a lot of fun and very yeah. tempting, but I think the best thing you should do is actually run and gun for the first couple times yeah. and then maybe jump into a private match and okay. learn the vehicles on your own mm -hmm. so you don't have people shooting you down instantly. That would make like sense. Like me. I mean, yeah, I guess that's a little counterintuitive. Because yeah. if I see tank, I'm like, I need to be in that tank right now. Exactly. And my me. first thought is, I need to destroy that tank right now. Oh, OK. So they it would be moving. probably a little bit harder. OK. Um, so you talked about going prone a little bit mm -hmm. earlier. When is a good time to crouch? When is a good time to go prone? When is a good time to just stand up like a man and take it? <laughs> <laughs> Never stand up like a man. Okay, that makes sense. Um, no, you can you can go prone whenever the heck you need to. Um, yeah. For better accuracy, to hide is pretty much the biggest one here, though. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see a lot of snipers always in prone. Okay. Just laying here, never touching their you know their left stick. Yeah. Because they don't need to, and they just aim all day. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, one of the, s the snipers are obviously one of the uh, the, the main major classes. headaches when yeah. you're playing a game like this. How do you how do you deal with snipers? I rage quit. You rage quit? <laughs> yeah. You're just like I F actually this, I'm out. I do. Uh, it really frustrates me that people don't want to play the game with me. Yeah. They just want to sit there and camp, and that's boring to me. Yeah. So, but that's that's battlefield, you know. You get used to it. You you, you deal with it. But I personally love running and gunning. Mm -hmm. So you'll see you'll see me coming in here and just annihilating. Look at this dude doesn't even know I'm here. So I noticed that you're really good at uh, hiding around corners. Oh, I'm fantastic at hiding around what corners. What are you thinking when you're doing that? Like, wh what is the angle here? Um, hiding like around corners. You're, whenever you're, uh, like. This game is very dark, okay. that's for sure. They really darkened everything in this game. So hiding in a corner mm -hmm. totally makes you invisible. Right. And that's what I'm doing. And I assume that when you're running around a map, you probably want to be sticking to the walls. Yes, is that a good absolutely. Never, never run into the street. Never run at, run around in the middle of the field. Right. Easily spotted. Isn't that the heroic way to do it, though? Guns blazing. You would, you would think. You would think. You would think. Hero but heroism. Heroism. You know, I camp, but I don't camp too much. Okay. I see. You know, so I'm like hiding behind the wall, but then I'm not. Mm -hmm. And then I always push up when I get a couple kills because this is a huge squad based game. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be a couple kids holding each other's hands. Right. And I, uh, I like. I like taking those kids out right. first. Right, you like just lobbing grenades and, oh, yeah. and running oh, around. Oh, yeah. And it's my favorite that makes, thing in the world. That makes sense. <laughs> um, so another thing, one, one more thing I want to ask you. Um, when I'm in these games, I have a tendency to try to aim for people's heads. Is that Ooh. not such a good idea? Not really. Where should I be aiming? Right at their smack dab chest. Right in the chest? Yeah, because when you're aiming at the chest and, it, and the gun pulls up, yeah. it'll instantly hit his head. Oh. So you get the instant headshot anyways. OK, so if you're aiming for the head, it's just one the of the things miss. you should do. Just you know, just aim for the chest, and if you have that problem with uh, controlling your weapon going up or down, mm -hmm. just let it go up, and you'll nick them in the head, and you'll be fine. All right, Kelly, thanks for coming by. We appreciate the, the pro tips. Hopefully, you guys found that at least a little helpful <laughs> for getting into the game and hopefully not dying a horrible death immediately. Uh, stick around. we got more Battlefield. <laughs>
Our story begins with a wealthy Russian ultranationalist named Imran Zakayev. Things have been tough ever since that whole arm injury, but the one thing keeping you going is a desire to overthrow the Russian government. Luckily for you, you've got more than enough money to do that. Do you A, use your money to run for president where you'll fix the country's problems from within? B, invest your money in charity to help the sick and teach the nation's youth practical career skills? Or C, fund a bloody coup in the Middle East to distract the whole world from your plans at home? You answered C, well done. Who needs politics and charity anyways? You're a rich, evil villain. Now you're in the shoes of an American soldier named Paul Jackson who's just been sent into the very same Middle Eastern country where a coup has occurred. You've heard that the country's new leader, Khaled al-Assad, might have a WMD and you'd really prefer he didn't. But things turn ugly and you have to rescue a downed helicopter pilot just as the bomb is about to go off. Do you A, stage a daring rescue and escape the war zone just in the nick of time? B. Decide that the pilot really isn't worth saving and hightail it out of there. Or C. Die slowly and painfully with half the game left to go. You've chosen C. Well, it was worth a shot, wasn't it? Too bad about that whole dying slowly and horrifically in a nuclear explosion thing. Uh, maybe next time. And that brings us to our next chapter. You're now a rough and tumble Scottish soldier named Soap McTavish. You found out that Al-Assad has been getting his weapons from Imram Zakayev, so you've decided to track Zakayev down. Along the way, you found out that he's overtaken a missile launch facility with sights set on the American Eastern Seaboard. You manage to stop the missile strike, but while escaping the facility, your truck overturns after a bridge collapse. Suddenly, Zakayev shows up and kills several of your friends. Do you A, close your eyes and wish the bad man would go away? B, reload your save game and take a driving route with a more stable bridge? Or C, decide that dying is for babies and surprise Zakayev with a gunshot to his dumb ultranationalist face. You've answered C, great choice. Too bad about your friends though. Nah, eh, don't worry, you'll make new ones. Now, on to Modern Warfare 2. The year is now 2016. Zakayev may be dead, but his faction of violent ultranationalists have taken over the Russian government. The most important character in that faction is Zakaya's former lieutenant, Vladimir Makarov, a man whose interests include pottery, backgammon, and terrorism. More on him later. You begin the story as General Shepard of the U.S. Army. You lost 30,000 men in that nuclear blast a few years ago. Now you're mad as hell and eager to reestablish America's military dominance. Do you A. Petition the Pentagon for a higher operating budget and more troops? B. Decide that maybe fighting isn't the best way to solve your problems after all. Or C. Establish an elite counterterrorism task force that you secretly plan on using to spark a new cold war and rally the entire country around your cause. You answered C. Very clever. You've got a future in this whole military strategy thing. Now you're Russia. All of it. The whole country. An act of terrorism has just occurred at a major airport orchestrated by Vladimir Makarov. Only thing is, you don't know it was Makarov because he escaped safe and sound. But the American soldier who secretly infiltrated his terrorist cell did not. The same soldier recruited by Shepard to join the newly established Task Force 141. Now you're super angry at America and over all that civilian bloodshed. Do you A, write a stern letter to the President of America expressing that you're not angry, just disappointed. B. Launch a thorough investigation into the incident to determine who is actually behind the whole thing. Or C. Invade America. You've gone with C. Take that, America. Now Russian soldiers are all over American soil and it looks like World War III is officially underway. You're now Captain Price, squad mate Soap McTavish, and the both of you are caught up in this whole Task Force 141 mess. You and Soap have vowed to save your American buddies, and to do so, you've made your way to a Russian submarine base. Do you A, find out who's in charge there and tell them that Americans aren't so bad? They mean well, they're just really loud and impulsive, like a puppy. B, steal military intelligence and use that to determine Russia's next point of attack. Or C, confuse the living hell out of your squad mates by going rogue and firing a nuclear strike that you set to go off directly above America, actually acting as an EMP to give American soldiers a slight advantage against the Russians. You've picked C, bold move, soldier, but it seems to have worked. You probably could have warned your buddies, though. They were really worried that you'd gone terrorist for a second there. 
Now you're back in the shoes of General Shepard. A few other members of Task Force 141 have obtained critical intelligence against Russia, but they know that you planted the American soldier in Makarov's terrorist cell and might tell Russia it was actually Makarov responsible for the whole airport incident after all. Do you A, politely ask them to keep their mouths shut about it? B, tell them it was all a dream. They don't even have airports in Russia. C, shoot them, cover them in gasoline, and burn them alive. You've gone with C. Again, you really like C, don't you? And burning people alive by the look of it. Yeah, you know, whatever gets the job done. Now you're back to being Captain Price. Shepard has turned his back on Task Force 141, and to make matters worse, he's been given a blank check by the United States government. That turn of events has put a big red target on you and Soap McTavish. Now that the most powerful military commander in the world wants you dead, do you A, run and hide in a remote corner of the world, never to be heard from again? B, change your name to Schmapton Schmice and hope nobody can tell the difference? Or C, find the location of Shepard's secret military base and hope that two dudes are enough to take out hundreds or possibly thousands of highly trained elite soldiers? You've chosen C, that's, uh, oh, okay, all right, yeah, that's, that's fine. Not what I would have gone with, but you have a style all your own. I like it, just uh, try not to die, okay? Now you've switched over to being Soap McTavish. You and Price have infiltrated Shepard's secret base, Site Hotel Bravo. After managing to kill off hundreds or possibly thousands of highly trained elite soldiers, you finally found your man. An epic standoff has gone down, and just when it looks like you were about to finish off Shepard, he pretty much ruins your day by stabbing you right in the chest. Ouch. Now you're lying on the ground, slowly bleeding to death while Shepard beats down Price a few feet away. Do you A, slowly bleed to death, B, slowly bleed to death, or C, dramatically pull the knife out of your chest, flip it around, and plant that thing right square in Shepard's ugly face? You've selected C. Oh boy, you really do know how to tell a story, don't you? Very dramatic, lots of twists, and I especially like that bit at the end where you did the thing with the knife in the face. Great work. And look at that, your buddy Nikolai came and rescued you from bleeding to death. I'd say that's a win-win right there. Well, you've managed to once again make the world a safer place. At least until Modern Warfare 3 comes out on November 8th. Good luck, soldier. Well, I'm learning so much today on On The Spot. It was you know a what very I learned that? educational program. It, it was. And you know what's most important to me? What? Is that Americans are like puppies. <laughs> They're loud and impulsive, yes. but we mean well, we right? We mean well. We have the best of intentions at heart. You can curl up with us next to the fire. That's right. Have a good time. That's that's what Americans are all that about. That started out curling. nice, and then it got kind of that weird. That was a little I'm weird, Maxwell. Um, so I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to recover nicely from okay. that. You know what we've got? We've got a we have a sweet headset. We have this sweet headset. This is a, a Razer headset. More importantly, it's a Razer Banshee. It's got the StarCraft II branding on it. Mm -hmm. This is a really excellent looking pair of um, headphones. These I look think they fantastic. used. I think when I was at when I was at BlizzCon, they had those headphones on all of the PC setups there, and they felt very nice. And it was super loud already, so I can't really speak yeah. to their their audio quality. But they felt really good on my ears. And just to be clear, it's an actual headset. It's not just headphones. It's a headset, yeah. so you can you know you can talk. You know you can act like you Marcus from Gears of War. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm getting me. caught up. Or like Batman. It's like he's revive got the thing that's me. Yeah, exactly. Revive me. So <laughs> that's what. So <laughs> That's what Batman says. That's what Batman Revive says. me. There's nobody and here on the one-man show. He's but... like, I got you. Or I guess it would be Robin. Let's nobody talk about trusts Robin. Nobody trusts Robin. Um, so anyway, we've got the Razor he Banshee. And if you want to win this, what you want to do is answer the following trivia question. In the original StarCraft, what is the name of Arcturus Manx's rebel group? If you know the answer, what you do is send an email to onthespot at gamespot.com or you use that handy dandy trivia module over on the right hand side of the page and we will be happy to send the winner these awesome headphones slash headset because they're not really headphones or a headset. And that is the full name of this product. Not, not a headphone, but a headset? Right, this is the Razer Banshee. It's like crossed out on the front of it. And actually I have a Razer keyboard, Razer mouse mm -hmm. at home and uh, fine, fine products. I like the lights to the, the Razer family of products. Well, my favorite thing to do on my Razer things is to change the lights because they, they glow from oh, behind. Oh, it's got all that you get. What do you like? You like the red? You like to feel in charge? You like the green? You like to feel at ease? Maybe the blue? Minty fresh? <laughs> Maxwell. <laughs> okay. So, yes, you want to win these. 
So I'm going to set these down. Um, that's kind of bringing us to the end of the show, but I got a oh, few really? reminders for everybody and for you, Maxwell, okay. because I know you don't pay any attention to the site I'm except not. what you do. You live in your own little world. I do. Yeah. But uh, we've got, uh, tomorrow we've got um, two extra special shows for you. First, we've got the next episode of The Controller coming up. So if you're interested in Battlefield 3, if you like reality programs, if you like to see drama <laughs> surrounding games, well, then there you go. It's got you've all got, of those elements. It's got all of those elements and more. It's got the personal drama and the in-game drama. It does. And occasionally um, some funny, funny moments here and there. Occasionally people get shot on that show, too. Occasionally. So you got to watch out for that. Real people. Real people. I mean, we're not even Real talking people and people, people die. You want to see the next person die on the controller? Watch tomorrow's episode. We well, can't actually guarantee that anybody's going to die on the controller tomorrow. Well, that's in the fine print, but nobody says that out loud. That's true. Um, also, tomorrow, um, obviously, people like their Modern Warfare, so we do have a Modern Warfare 3 now playing tomorrow, so you definitely want to tune in, check that out, see what's going to be new in the upcoming Modern Warfare game that you might not have expected. Or something, right, Maxwell? I bet You're it's supposed to be agree. Awesome. Are you still I do this totally. Game? I, look at this. Look at this game. Look at this okay, big Can we switch dude. over to the game switch so we can the game see feed. what uh, Watch this. Final boss. What's up? I made it. This game apparently right, can, can we hold on isn't a moment? super long. Okay. Well, let's, let's take just a little look at this final boss. Okay. All right. We'll take give so you guys just, just not, a peek. Yeah, not to. You can't even see the whole final along. boss right now. It's just it's just a little teaser. It's a giant hoof. That's it. <laughs> Prepare yourselves, so ladies and gentlemen, for the final boss of Serious Sam Random Encounter. Also, I just picked up the cannon weapon. Oh no, he's got minions. But yeah, I'm probably gonna go down in a blaze of glory. So we should just get out of here. All right, let's get out of there. Maxwell McGee, thank you for joining. Thank you for letting um, me hang out. On absolutely, the show. It was fun. and thanks to everybody else that joined uh, that joined us today. We had Marco Georgievich, who's sitting over there in the wings, um, <laughs> looking slightly embarrassed. Yeah, um, we've also we also had Tom O'Shea, who showed us Uncharted through, and also a bunch of dying. Yeah, a um, lot of dying on today's show, actually. Yeah, but that's that's good, and also on the controller tomorrow. Yeah, possibly. Possibly. I can't make we any. Can't guarantee. I, I can't I'm guarantee. Serious. But thanks for joining us. I'm Kevin Van Ord for another episode of On the Spot.